Amen. Word of the Lord, uh, read by Minister Riggins, um, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 6 through 14. That's the context. Um, we'll just read the text, verses 6 through 10 of Ephesians 5 from the New King James Version. I believe our media ministry has it on the screen before me and behind me. And so you will um, read it aloud with your pastor, Ephesians 5, 6 through 10. Clear your throat and in your best preacher voice. Come on, let's read it together. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons or children of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Parenthetically, for the fruit of the Spirit is found in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Verse 10. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. You can be seated, beloved, in the presence of the Lord. This morning... We come to continue, my Mary, our series entitled The Walk of the Believer. And today, Herschel, we come to consider what is um, the second trait, the second characteristic, the second mark of Vanessa, the New Testament believer. And that is, we walk in light. Uh, last week, you'll remember, you'll remember last week, Sister Brigitte, that um, we looked at in this same contextual environment, uh, verses 1 through 5 of Ephesians 5, where the Apostle Paul puts pen to paper and calls and challenges the church to walk in love. And in fact, Paul says to them, Bishop, that we are to be imitators of God as dear children, like dear children. And Nicole, because of that, as we imitate God, uh, we are to walk in love. So that another way, another way of our saying that is that to love is to be like God because John tells us in 1 John chapter 1 that God is love. And so that if we're going to be imitators, um, literally, if the, the Greek word uh, there for imitate uh, literally is the word to mimic somebody it, it is it is to watch someone do something and then literally act like you see them acting uh, when, when I was a boy, when I was a boy long, long time ago, when I was a boy, we used to play a game called Simon says. Okay, okay, don't leave me out here by myself like I'm the only old head up in here. Uh, Simon says, and G, and we stand in line, somebody be in the front, and they say, Simon says, touch your head with your right hand, and you touch your head with your right hand. Simon says, put out your left foot, you put out your left foot, and, and they do that about four, five, six times, and then they say, put out your right hand, and then you put out your right hand, and they say, disqualified, because we didn't say, Simon says, <laughs> Because the whole purpose of Simon Says is to mimic the one who is giving you permission and setting the parameters. I'm preaching and y'all don't know it. And that's what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 5, the opening portion and passage of that pericope. He says, be imitators, be mimics of God. Whatever you see God do, you do it. And, and, and one of the ways, one of the ways, Deacon Gary Croft, that we most act like God is when we love. I lost all of y'all. I'm going to try it again. One of the ways 
We most act like God, look like God, resemble God. In the words of the old folk, favor God. You know, when somebody look like their mama, old folks say two things. You the spitting image, which is not Lee the way that goes. <laughs> it is not <laughs> spitting image. The phrase is the spirit and image. But you know us. <laughs> Don't let us get a hold of something. We'll shorten it up, <laughs> Daryl. And when you hear it again, it's totally different. The, 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 the European folks said, that person, that boy, that girl is the spirit and image of their child. When grandma got it, <laughs> grandma said, they the spitting image. <laughs> you and I, my man, if you and I going to be the spitting image of God, then one of the ways we most look like God, resemble God, favor God, is when we love. Today, I'll talk more about this um, in, later on in the service. Today is the actual birthday of the apostle of nonviolence, the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and somebody ought to clap about that. I'm not going to let y'all, with the passing of time, forget Dr. King. We, we're not going to do that. We're not going to relegate him to the ash heap of life, to the dust of antiquity. Uh, without that man's voice and force and life and labor, our nation, our lives would be so different from what they are today. We ought to celebrate him. We ought to laud him. We ought to applaud him. We ought to remember him. And uh, Lee, today is his birthday, January 15, 1929. Doc was born there on Sweet Auburn in Atlanta, Georgia. Doc King, Doc King, who could have been anything he wanted to be. Brilliant, scholarly, articulate, dynamic, loquacious, and forceful. Could have been anything he wanted to be. But chose to be a pastor of a little church down there in Alabama. Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. And there in the fulcrum of time became the voice of the conscience of this nation. And Dr. King would always say, don't let anybody drag you so low that you start to hate them. Because hate is a burden we cannot bear and it is an expense we cannot afford to pay. I feel like preaching up here today. And I know, I know, I know there's a lot going on in our world. I know, I know there's still a lot of injustice, inequity, unfairness, bias, prejudice, racism. But beloved, you and I must resist the urge, the tendency, the temptation to fall into the quagmire and quicksand of hatred that pollutes us and poisons us and hinders us from being all that God has created us to be. We, we, we must rise above it. Somebody say rise above it. We must rise. Yeah, they do us wrong, but we must rise above it. We've been maligned and marginalized, but we must rise above it. We've been mistreated. We've been misrepresented. We've been misaligned and we've been rejected and scarred, but we must rise above it. And one way we do that, beloved, is by refusing to give in to the demon of hatred. Hmm. I, uh, I had lunch one day last week with two pastors of the AME Church, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the church of Richard Allen. And uh, I asked them both because they are prominent pastors in that denomination. I asked them both. I said, um, do, do you ever hear from? Uh, Mrs. Pinckney, and some of y'all don't know who that is, the widow of that 
preacher, that pastor, and Mother Emmanuel in Charleston who died in that vicious act of hatred by that demented person. And I use that word loosely. That demented, demonic, hate-filled person. I said, do, do you ever hear from her and her children? I said to them, uh, Pug was with me at lunch. I took him with me. I, I said, you know, it was about a month or so after the massacre at Mother Emanuel that I discovered in talking to, I believe it was an Amy Bishop, it might have been an Amy Pastor, I do not recall, that I discovered that on that night in Bible study, Mrs. Pinckney and the children were in his office and heard the shooting that took the life of their husband and father. I said, do you ever hear from her, how is she fearing? And they both responded almost, um, oh yes, oh yes. We, we, we know how she's doing. In fact, one of them said she has an active speaking schedule. She goes around this country, listen to me. She goes around this country speaking on college campuses about the power of love over hatred. Y'all ain't gonna help me. That how, I, I, I think I lost my church, let me try online for, how by the grace of God and the strength of God and the might of God and the power of God, you can come back from the most catastrophic experience of your life and find a place to live and land so that you can function in wholeness and healing to help somebody else. You and I, I, I I'll leave it alone, but I feel it. You and I, there's so much that can make us angry and filled with vitriol and filled with hatred. But Paul reminds us, Deacon Didi, we've got to be mimics, imitators of God, like dear children, like a child puts on their parents' clothes. Little girl puts on her mother's high heels. Little boy puts on his father's overcoat, walks through the house with it dragging the floor. Look, mommy, I look like daddy. Look, daddy, I look like mommy. Imitators. Paul says in the Greek, same way that children imitate, mimic their parents, you and I, who claim to be saved ought to imitate God, ought to act like God, ought to resemble, ought to be the spitting image of God. And he says, first way, we saw it last week, first way you do it is you walk in love. That, that same Paul, I'm crossing the field now, that same Paul, that same Paul, uh, continues his argument in this particular passage in Pericope, this portion of sacred scripture, this part of the canon, uh, that same Paul uh, lifts before us what is, it's, it's amazing how natural it falls and flows together. One does not even need to be an exegetical wizard to do this, just able to read. It flows so freely. It's, it flows so naturally. He says, uh, ending there at verse 5, walk in love. And then, Mom Erin, he picks it up in verse 6. Let no one deceive. Are y'all, do y'all have time for this? I, 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 I feel as if I'm intruding on something you're doing. Like making your shopping list or texting someone. Do I need to stop so you can do what you need to do? Or can I press on? Okay, I shall press on. L listen to what he says. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon. He says, New King James says sons, but we know that sons, daughters, the children of disobedience. Therefore, everybody say therefore. Do not be partakers of them. Now, anytime you see the word therefore, you got to ask what it's there for. And it's there because it's a connecting term to everything Paul's about to say to what he's already said. 
And so he says, now you walk in love. Don't walk, it, I talked about it last week, we don't walk in the sensual aspects of life. Adultery, fornication, lascivious, okay, y'all getting quiet. We don't walk in that, amen. Don't, don't, let anybody just, don't let anybody tell you it doesn't matter, it's not wrong, you can do it. Don't let anyone deceive you with empty words. For because of those things, those things in verse 5, the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. Therefore, don't you partake in those things. Then he skips down to verse 8 where I want to pitch my preaching tent for the next 15 minutes. Here it is. He says, for you were once darkness, but now, everybody say now. But now you are light in the Lord. Wow. Um, Bill, I, uh, I don't know how to say this, but to say it, so I'm just going to say it. Did you notice what Paul says here? Paul, okay, look at it. Verse 8, for you were once darkness. You, were one, you missed it. Let me show it to you. Not you once lived in darkness. Not you once hung around darkness. Not you once saw darkness. Not even once you acted dark. He says you were darkness. Okay, y'all ain't with me. No, you were darkness. You, 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 it, it wasn't that you were in it. You were it. Okay, Angie, I don't think John, they, they're not going to help me. Okay, here, it's not that you were in darkness. He is emphatic in what he said. Once upon a time, you were darkness. Your very essence, your very existence, your, your very being, your very nature, your very makeup. I'm sorry, I, that is so unfair. Your very, your very, my very, our very essence, existence, and nature was darkness. Okay, y'all still didn't see it. Now, do, do you realize how bad we really were? <laughs> Okay, y'all didn't see it, y'all. Okay, I know y'all think y'all been nice all your life. But do you know how jacked up we really were? Do you know what a mess we were? He says you were once darkness. And, and if that were the final estimation of my condition, I'd go somewhere and get drunk. If someone told me you are darkness, period, I would go somewhere and get as high as Cootie Brown. But thank God for the next line. For you were once darkness, wait a minute, but now, I double dog dare you to shout but now, but now you are light, not have light, not see light, not walk only in light, you are light. Okay, okay, Sister Steve, y'all still didn't get it. Do you feel like giving God praise for the dramatic difference he made in your life that he took you from darkness? <laughs> uh, to light. John says in 1 John 1, God is love. And then he says, Deacon Skelton, in that same, that same chapter, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. You and I are light. We were darkness, but now, in Christ, don't miss that, in Christ, we are light. And so we let our light shine. God, I feel like preaching this. It, it, it is amazing. You'll allow me one parenthetical aside. I, I won't park. I'll just pull over. Um, you do know the very first thing God introduced in the world was light. Genesis 1, in the beginning, God, Elohim, Adonai, Yahweh, God created heaven and earth. The earth was without 
form and void and darkness <laughs> was upon the face of the deep, King James, but a better word, the abyss, the confusion, darkness filled it, flooded it, took every part of it, but the Spirit of God hovered <laughs> over the face of the deep, and God said, let there be, I wish I had Bible, let there be, and there was light. And that's why John picks it up in John, are y'all still with me? In John 1 and says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of humanity. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness cannot put it out. First thing, Kevin, God made was light. Stay with me. To push back darkness. Deacon Skelton, y'all don't even see. I'm setting y'all up like bowling pins, and y'all don't even know it. He, he, he steps into darkness and introduces light. The first thing he does, Angie, is turn on the lights. God, I feel like preaching this. Let there be light. And there was light. The light shines in darkness and the darkness is powerless against the dunamis, the power of the light. And yes, we live in a dark world. And in dark times. And yes, there is darkness all around us. But what better time, Lee, for the saints to be the saints and be the light of the world than in a moment of abject darkness. Walk then, Paul's admonition, walk then as... Children, did you notice the corollary? He tells us to, like, dear children, mimic our parent, imitate God. Then he says, walk as children of light. I am Deacon George R. Mary Sr. I sometimes uh, uh, find myself... Uh, on the horns of a proverbial dilemma because I'm always telling the saints to grow up and mature. Uh, mindful though, I don't tell y'all this, but mindful that the Bible exhorts and encourages us to be children. Until one day I found the key to that conundrum and the answer to my dilemma. <laughs> he calls us to be children, not childish. We walk as children of light, but we're not childish. We're not immature. We're not selfish. Y'all ain't helping me. Um, Jossie, our only living daughter. Uh, Jossie, I don't think she mind. Besides, if she mind, she's not here. Um, <laughs> Jossie turned 40 uh, last October 11. She's 40 years old. Um, so, so, you know, I mean, she couldn't grow. She couldn't grow. She couldn't, but she's still my child. Y'all ain't y'all on here when I'm saying. I don't care when she gets 60, she'll be my child. Now I don't want her to be childish. I want her to act mature, but she'll always be my child. Y'all aren't hearing what I'm saying. And beloved, we are always children of God, but we must grow up to maturity so that we can handle the things of God and represent God in the earth realm. 
He says, walk as children of light. I'm glad you, I'm glad you're listening because you know the question. Every sermon Dr. Samuel D. Witt Proctor said has to raise at least one relevant question. And so the relevant question for this sermon today is how I do that. <laughs> what, what does that look like? I'm glad you asked. In the next 14 minutes, write these three things down. The first thing is that to walk in the light is to live a life of transformation. It, it's, it's to live a transformed life. It's what Paul says, say Paul who writes Ephesians, writes Romans 12, one and two. I beseech you therefore brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, your reasonable act of worship. And do not be conformed, drum roll to this world. Here it is, but be ye what church? Transformed. By the renewing of your mind. Pop, the way I walk in the light as he is in the light is that uh, I live a transformed life. He says you were once darkness, but now <laughs> you are children of light. Now you are light in the Lord. What a transformation. Only he could do that. What a wonderful change. Y'all don't know old songs. Let, let, Sister Norma, Lachelle, uh, L, L, Sister Ross, they, they, they don't know old songs. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus, only four folk know it, came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy over my soul <laughs> like a sea billow rose. Since Jesus came into my heart. What a transformation. Do you realize what a change he made in your life? It is nothing short of a miraculous transformation. What does that look like? Write these three things down. A, uh, this transformation is powerful. Uh, it, it changes everything. Anyone be in Christ? What church? They are a... Sister Raina, you and Brother Sims, they are a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, everything becomes new. But, but my Mary, not only is it, not only is it uh, powerful, uh, this transformation is personal. Okay, I don't know how to say it. I'm going to say it. God doesn't save en masse. Okay, y'all don't know what that means. God doesn't save on the group plan. <laughs> Ten of y'all get together, I'm going to save all of y'all at one time. That'll lower the price. Like insurance plans. No. God saves us one by one. Whoever calls on the... Sister Kareem, you and Brett Clifford, whoever calls... Hey, Pastor Jimmy, Jimmy O, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This transformation is powerful. This transformation, beloved, is personal, and I'm going to close on this point with this, and this transformation is permanent. I would talk to y'all about that, that show used to come on 20, 30 years ago, Transformers. You used to buy your kids those old Transformers, they start out a truck, turn into, a, into something else. Trans now, that, I, I don't want to do that one. Greatest transformation is a caterpillar that in a cocoon becomes a butterfly. <laughs> something that's slimy and slithery, something not attractive, in a process of metamorphosis becomes something beautiful and elegant. 
It goes from a caterpillar. Y'all just stay awake in science. It goes from a caterpillar to a butterfly. Hey, Angie, I'm going to drop the mic on this. And once it becomes a butterfly, it never becomes a caterpillar again. Oh, God. Oh, God. Y'all, Deacon Leonard, you, but y'all making me work too hard. That once it's been transformed from a caterpillar to a butterfly, you don't see a butterfly trying to go back in the cocoon, having flown, having been beautiful, having been graceful, want to go back to an ugly, slithering caterpillar because it's a permanent transformation. I'm coming for you, so you might as well get ready. And having tasted of the goodness and the grace of God why in the world would you want to go back to the mess he brought you up out of can I preach in my own pulpit with the mic I paid for is there anybody here today who can holler I ain't going back been there done that and I'm not going back This transformation, powerful, personal, permanent. Woo. Here's the second point. I have 10 minutes. Walking in the light is to live a life of transparency. Paul says, walk as children of light. You know that Greek word walk, I've told you, don't mean taking a stroll. It means how you live. In verses 11 through 12, Paul talks about what he calls the deeds of darkness. Things done in the dark. In secret. In the words of Flip Wilson, in the corner, in the dark, in the booth. Y'all don't know Flip. <laughs> in the corner, in the dark, in the booth. <laughs> Me and Mrs. Jones. We meet every day at the same cafe. 6.30. I know she'll be there. In the corner, in the dark, <laughs> in the booth. Am I wrong to give my... Okay, let me stop, let me stop, let me stop, let me stop. Ain't none of them in the hymn, no. Let me stop. In, 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 in contrast, Erica, the believer lives a transparent life because we live in the light. We're not in the dark. We live in the light. We let our light shine so that others see our good work, our behavior, our conduct, and they glorify the Father in heaven. We, uh, we live a transparent life. Old folks said, Adrian, that our lives ought to be open books, seen and read by everybody. And in order to live this transparent life, there are three things we have to do. A, we have to constantly consider our lives constantly uh, check up on ourselves. Do a self-check up. How am I doing? How am I, don't, don't look at me in that tone of voice. Just a constant check up. How am I doing? Consider your life. Then B, we have to constantly clean our lives. You know, I'm scared of you folk got saved in 1973 and they haven't done nothing since then. You know, child, I mean when my dungeon shook, my chains fell off. We're 1947. And you haven't cleaned up your act since then. You wouldn't do that to your house or your car. You ought not do that to your life. Preach, Clark. I'm doing the best I can with a suddenly hostile crowd. You wouldn't wear the same clothes over and over again, spill mustard on them, drop stuff on them, never take them to the cleaners. If you wouldn't do with your clothes and you do, wouldn't do with your car and you wouldn't do it with your house, why would you do it with your life? Why would you live year after year after year doing stuff you know is not right, not pleasing to God and never clean your life up? 
We have to constantly consider our lives, constantly clean our lives, and then constantly conduct our lives in a way that honors God. Look what Paul says. Find out what pleases the Lord. Lord, you know, people are, is, you know, does the Bible, I was talking to uh, a couple of our young people yesterday, and they were asking me about something, and, I, and one of them said, well, Bishop, the Bible doesn't say, I said, oh, the Bible don't say a lot of stuff. Bible doesn't say you shouldn't smoke weed. Look at y'all. Y'all like, praise the Lord. That's right. <laughs> I think got a lot of converts right there. Bible doesn't say you shouldn't smoke weed. Come on, y'all. The Bible is a rule and guide for faith, for life and living. The Holy Spirit dwells in us to give us wisdom and direction. Come on, y'all ain't helping me. Y'all not helping me. We find out what pleases the Lord. It isn't about what the Lord tells us to do. It's what we know pleases him. Nobody married to anybody for more than 27 hours. Want to have a marriage where the only time you get something is when you ask for it. Real love says, you know, she likes this. I think I'll pick it up. You know, he likes this. I think I'll make that today. Love doesn't have to ask, oh God, I'm through, I'm through, I'm through, I'm through. And if it always has to ask, I wonder how deep is your love? Well, here's, I have eight minutes. Here's the third. Walking in the light is to live a transformed, a transferred life. Verse 14, therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you life. You and I need to remember this morning as I close that this marvelous light that is in us does not come from us. Get over yourself. You, 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 you don't have light because you lighty. <laughs> I just made that word up. Light comes from God. Verse 8, you are light in the Lord. <laughs> and separated from the Lord, our bulb goes out. I can't get help up in here. Would you tap a neighbor and say, that's why I'm shining today. I I'm shining because I have a transfer of light in my life. I, I feel like preaching. I got six minutes. I may give you three of them back. Here it is. Tap a neighbor. Say, neighbor, here's what it means to live a transferred life. It means I'm connected to him. I, I told y'all that time I was in a real fancy hotel. I mean, one of them, I think it was the Ritz Carl, real fancy hotel, and I needed to iron my shirt because it got wrinkled in transport. <laughs> While it was in the suitcase, I was flying somewhere, it got wrinkled, and I had to speak before these highfalutin' folk, and I didn't want to get up there and embarrass my grandmama with a wrinkled shirt on. So I went into the closet, I went, Oak wood closet, a beautiful closet built into the wall. I took down the, uh, the, uh, the uh, ironing board, took down the iron, plugged it in like I saw my grandma do it when she was ironing shirts for white folk to keep a roof over our head. I plugged it and I turned it on. I even did what I saw her do. I went, boom, see if it was hot. <laughs> I mean, I watched what she did. And I started ironing. And I noticed there wasn't no wrinkles coming out. So I said, well, I got to press off. So I pressed harder. There wasn't no wrinkles coming out. And I pressed harder. And finally, the Holy Ghost said, look at the wall. And I looked down at the wall where the socket was. And I had, in my excitement, forgotten to plug it in. 
So which means the ironing board was up. I put water in the iron. I even tested it to see if it was hot. But I hadn't plugged it in. Therefore, there was no connection. Therefore, there was no power. I wish I had help right here. And how many of y'all come to church every Sunday and you look real good, but there's no power because you're not connected? Would you look at a neighbor, smile behind the mask, and say, get connected? connected get connected the only way you and I are going to live a transferred life is we've got to be connected I'm going y'all here's B it means we are controlled by him I'm not just connected to him but a life of living walking in the light comes because he transfers his power to me but he can't transfer it if I'm not connected he can't transfer transfer it if he doesn't control me so that it's not my will but thy will be done I feel like preaching up here right now and I gotta close but would you turn 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 to one of your neighbors say neighbor it's not enough to be connected and it's not enough to be controlled but you and I must become a con do it of his power. We must become a vessel of his power. We must become a reservoir of his power so that the power of God can flow in us and then flow through us to touch a world that is bruised, battered, and broken. Good morning, y'all. May the Lord bless you real good. But can I close it up? like our choir used to sing it when I was a teenager in New York I want to live so God can use me anytime and anywhere I want to live so God can use me anytime and anywhere is there anybody here who wants God to use him anybody here wants God to use her would you just tell God use me in your service use me to your glory use me every day I want to live so God can use me I want to walk in the light as he is in the light Jesus the light of the world is there anybody here who's walking in light today I got one more old song and then I'm going to let you go. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior. Stepping in the light. Stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior. Led in paths of light. Would you turn, turn, turn to one of your neighbors and say, neighbor, come on from the dark side cross over into the light and let's walk in the light as he is in the light I feel like preaching the Bible says in the book of Revelation that there's a city over there called the New Jerusalem the link and the breath and the height of it all are equal there are three gates in the east three gates in the west three gates in the north three gates in the south oh what a beautiful city 12 gates in the city hallelujah there's a tree in the middle of the city the leaves of which are good for the healing of the nation there's no sickness there's no death but guess what else y'all there's no night there so there's no need for a kerosene light there's no need for fluorescent light there's no need for a flashlight 
for the Son of God will light up the city and every day or sucks will be Sunday and Sabbath will have no end. Would you turn, turn, turn to one of your neighbors and holler, neighbor, how beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior. Let led in paths of light Jesus is the light of the world and he never he's ever shining in my soul Walk as children of life. Everybody stay.